let's dive back into the newspapers this morning. And uh, here with me uh, to do so are the journalists Harry Phibbs and Janelle Aldred. Uh, great to see you both again. Uh, Janelle, you've got the first one we're going into. This is one time from the Times, and it's uh, about councils and uh, some of the financial difficulties that some of them are facing. Yeah, it's kind of the front page and the inside page are kind of linked. So bad management's bankrupting councils. So in the past um, three years, six councils have gone into bankruptcy. And so now what they're going to be doing is actually ranking councils to see if there can be an early alarm that they're actually going to be in difficulty, which is what's on the inside. And there's going to also as well, which I find interesting, be an online tool to help the public compare their local council on all things like rubbish collection, also seeing how much debt they have, how much of the council tax money is going into servicing a debt. So you'll be able to see your council, the council, the neighbouring councils, and also see other councils that have a similar profile to you. And I do think it is really interesting and it will become probably a bit more of a topic if more councils become bankrupt. Um, what's going to happen? Who's going to pay? Um, what will happen to council services? They don't have any money. Bin collection, they've got wages to pay and, and big bills as well. So um, I do think it's interesting, but I do think there needs to be more accountability and an online tool like this actually provides a bit more accountability for the council. So just one quick example, Gateshead spend 23% of its core spending on debt servicing, whereas Hackney spends less than 2%. I would be interested to know what my council is doing in that direction. For sure, it'd be interesting as well if it actually leads to accountability at the polls in local elections, or, or whether still that there's not actually enough coverage of, of this sort of thing to, to lead to changes uh, in who, who voters then pick. Um, uh, let's move on to, Harry, your choice first in this segment. You've gone with uh, Labour and housing policy. Yes, so th this is a story in the Financial Times that the Labour Party is planning to slash the, the discounts for right to buy. I think it's surprising in a way because the Conservatives traditionally are the party of home ownership and Labour have been trying to steal those clothes and make a quite effective point about the shortage the of houses. Is there to be stolen, do you think? Well, the, the, I mean, the, the, there is because the housing supply is, is, is much too small uh, and that's because of all the, all the planning restrictions uh, and, the, and the Green Belt and so on. And the, and the Labour Party is the, were the ones saying we want to have a proper housing market and to increase supply. But then at the same time, they're saying that for people in um, council housing, they're, they're wanting to um, thwart that aspiration for home ownership by, by cutting the... Um, uh, the, the discount. I mean, I think what, they, what we should be doing is, is extending that to housing associations and making it easier for, for people to have shared ownership, having a bigger discount. We should be trying to make it easier for people to get on the property ladder. And I think that the, in terms of replacement stock, councils have got a lot of surplus land and they could be much more innovative in in providing them, because the main cost of house building is the land, and so they could be, rather than saying, oh, we're, we're losing stock, they, they should be making a more of an effort to uh, to replace the stock. So I, I, I think it's a disappointing stance that the Labour Party is taking on this. Well, was, yesterday we had a, a bit of talk about that uh, the Conservatives trying to extend 30-year mortgages, but, you know, I mean, really comes back to planning and planning permission, and uh, at the moment, uh, that's still the big, the big hurdle. Yeah, I think we just need a long-term view, you know, Know, this is kind of a manifesto view. We need a long-term view about what to do about all of this. I mean, they're saying that people are flipping the houses and they're making a profit on it. But still, if we're talking about social mobility, you have to ensure that people on lower end incomes by extending mortgages can actually go into the property market, can buy a home. So yeah, it does seem a bit anti-labour to um, be slashing this discount, but I think we do need a big picture view that's a long-term view um, on what to do about housing because it's a big issue. Another one from the FT, Janelle, you've gone with uh, big tech outguns, venture capital firms and spending on generative AI startups. I know we talk about AI, so we absolutely glaze over like AI, what's this, nothing to do with me. AI is actually a massive part of our everyday life. If you think about sending a text you use generative AI, it spells out what you should be saying, what they think you're going to say next. That's what generative AI is. Um, and basically, big tech companies are out now outspending everyone on investing in this, which actually should make all of us pause to think. Because if we look at social media and some of the things that have happened in the past few years, especially around young people, the way they're not protected online, we can see that often big tech, sometimes, some of them, don't always put safety of users first. So actually, with generative AI being a massive part of how we live and a growing 
part of how we live. I think we should all be interested that actually big tech are wanting to dominate that market and spending billions in it. There needs to be a challenge. Well, and big tech is just quite so enormous now. It's uh, also, I guess, not surprising on that angle, given that they're, they're the ones with the, with the money spent. We're jumping now to our last story uh, to end on a, on a fun note. And this is, uh, this is this new statue of Shakira that's been uh, unveiled. Uh, in Colombia. And uh, I have to say, when I saw this picture this morning, I heard about it talked about on the radio, I actually think they've done it quite well. It, it's clearly her. Sometimes you see these statues unveiled and they, they don't look anything like the person. There's a Cristiano Ronaldo one. And then I saw the picture and you see the perspective of the size uh, and the person in the, the actual human in the foreground. It's rather enormous, this one, Harry. I think it's, I, I think it's splendid, but I agree with you. It's, we traditionally think of statues this size as, as a sort of the dear leader of some uh, dictatorship, don't we? Of some fascist or communist, you know, sort of you know, North Korea or, or, or somewhere. But, I, no, I think, uh, I, think it's, I think it's beautiful. I think it's impressive. And, uh, and 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 good for them. Uh, never mind that she's that uh, she's had she's been in one or two scrapes about um, uh, tax affairs or something. That's back. That's back in Spain. This is yeah. back in. This is in her native native Colombia. But anyway, yeah. there we go. We are tight on time, guys. We'll have to leave it. It's been a pleasure, Harry Janelle. Thanks so much. Thank you.